I haven't told you much about myself, because I desire to remain anonymous. There's nothing about the messenger that's important. It's the message that has value. Over the past year, I've brought you many videos that have discussed gold, silver, currencies, debt, derivatives, energy, stocks, and bonds. I have been fortunate that my life has taken me in a direction to develop important insights about the nature of all of these items. Insight that has been of great personal benefit. My goal is to provide you with these insights and to allow you to use them to succeed in a world economic system that's designed to see you fail. If I've done my job well, and I hope I have, these videos have provided you with the information you need to gain an understanding of our current world and understand the transition that we are going through right now. While I have attempted to keep the details very basic, many of my videos have been quite mathematical in nature in an effort to quantify some of the important differences between the item shown to the left, gold, and the item shown to the right, currency. The intent of this video is to provide you with a very high level understanding of why I choose to save in gold more so than dollar-denominated financial instruments, such as bank accounts, bonds, or stocks. I will avoid the use of quantitative measures so as to paint as clear a picture as possible. As with most other things in life, we learn about the nature of things through contrast. Without occasionally feeling cold, the definition of warm would have no significance. Without experiencing darkness, how can we know what it means for something to be bright? Without the experience of sadness and sorrow, we cannot truly experience joy. Think about this long and hard, and you will know that it is true. Thus, our experiences teach us a great deal about the nature of our world and the nature of ourselves through contrast. It is the same for gold. If you want to understand the nature of gold, you must understand the nature of what gold is not. And the item that is of greatest contrast to gold is the paper currency known as the US dollar. So let's study the nature of the dollar for a moment. What is it about the dollar that gives it its value? Why do we use it? It's just a piece of paper with a picture of a dead president, some numbers, and some phrases after all. Most of the transactions that we engage in every day don't even involve the use of physical dollar bills, but they are electronic in nature without us ever seeing the physical dollar itself. We never collectively voted and agreed that we would all use dollars in our transactions. So why do we do it? Let's list several factors for different classes of people that provide support for the, US, for the use of the dollar. After we're done discussing them, we can think through the common themes and come up with a label or two to describe them. We'll start with other sovereign nations. Why is it that despite what looks like crumbling support now, that they've supported the use of the dollar in international trade for as long as they have. For foreign nations, it comes down to the fact that the dollar is the default currency used in settling oil transactions. Most nations do not produce enough oil domestically, and so they have to import oil from other nations, which produce a surplus. This oil is absolutely critical. If other nations want to obtain it, then typically they will need to settle the transactions using U.S. dollars. So other nations need to have dollars in order to obtain energy to meet their domestic needs. Why do the surplus oil producers require dollars in exchange for their oil? One reason is gold. The most powerful oil nation in OPEC, Saudi Arabia, has been promised that they will be able to obtain gold in exchange for dollars. I've covered this in several videos in detail, but the main thing that you need to know is that there are agreements in place since the 1970s that guarantee Saudi Arabia that they will be able to obtain the gold that they want at a desirable dollar price in exchange for their requiring dollars in exchange for oil and their promise to use their influence with other OPEC nations to influence them to do the same. The dollar is kept strong in gold through the derivatives market where derivatives are used to keep the dollar price of gold weak. Another factor responsible in maintaining the use of dollars in the oil trade is military might. I've also covered this in other videos. You'll note that there have been instances where those in the Middle East who have announced the use of alternatives to the dollar for their oil trade have found themselves, shall we say, liberated? Of course, some nations have very powerful allies and military intervention is not very prudent. 
So for these nations, for example, Iran, we use economic sanctions against them, among other things, such as freezing them out of the SWIFT system. All of these are very powerful factors for maintaining the dollar for oil trade. They really do underpin the international support for the dollar. We can see now that these factors are starting to be challenged by some very important world powers, namely Russia and China, who are understanding now how this game is played. Now what about domestic dollar use? What is it that compels U.S. citizens to support the dollar? For U.S. citizens, it really comes down to taxes. Let me explain. In 1913, the 16th Amendment was ratified by the states, and the personal income tax was introduced in the U.S. 1913 was an interesting year because it was the same year in which the Federal Reserve came into being. Coincidence? Maybe, but I don't think so. Because, you see, the income tax is one of the devices that forces you to use dollars. While mention of dollars is not specifically in the 16th Amendment, the IRS measures the value of your income, however you are paid, in terms of dollars and requires that dollars are what is paid in settlement of income taxes. The effect of this is that if you want to earn a living in the U.S. and provide your services in return for an income, you will need dollars in order to pay taxes. Sure, you can opt to not participate in the system, but I think you'll find that your life would be considerably more difficult than it is now. The other tax that makes U.S. citizens dependent upon dollars is the property tax. States, counties, and towns derive a considerable portion of their revenue from taxes on property. They levy these taxes in dollars. If you own a home, you need to come up with a certain number of dollars per year to satisfy the tax on your property or risk losing your home. Even if you don't own a home but rent from someone else, you can be sure that a portion of your rent is there to cover the cost of the property tax. So you can see, even if you decide that working for an income is not for you, you'll find that the property tax ensures your participation in the dollar world. So the primary drivers of dollar demand are from the international perspective, the lock that the dollar has on the oil market, and from a domestic perspective, the tax system forcing U.S. citizens to use the dollar. These factors alone would probably be sufficient to generate enough demand for the dollar to make it a viable currency. But there is another factor that creates a demand for it, and that factor is debt. The U.S. federal government has a very large debt exceeding $17.5 trillion as of the date that I made this video. I hold to the view that this debt acts as a destabilizing force for the dollar. On the one hand, the debt forces the U.S. government to tax its citizens for dollars, which creates a demand for dollars domestically. But on the other hand, the larger the debt gets, the more questionable it becomes that the U.S. population can be taxed enough to honor it, 14th Amendment or not. The more questionable the debt becomes, the more questionable one of the pillars of dollar demand becomes, namely taxes. Then, there is the over $3 trillion worth of state and local debt that creates a demand for dollars. This debt has been assumed for local projects such as roads, bridges, incinerators, and other building projects. Regardless of the use of the loan, the terms of the loans are that they be paid back in dollars. Because states and local governments can't print these dollars like the federal government can, they have to get them through taxes and fees. So this debt provides one of the foundations upon which the property tax is built. Personal debt in the U.S. almost rivals the federal debt. It stands at about $16.4 trillion, and the U.S. consumer does not enjoy nearly the same low interest rates that the U.S. government enjoys. This personal debt creates a demand for dollars just as taxes do. Can the debtors default on this debt? Sure, but not without consequences. For example, about $13 trillion of this number is mortgage debt. Families can default on this debt, but the consequence is losing the house. So the U.S. consumer really is bound to try to come up with the dollars needed to satisfy these loans or suffer the consequences. Without getting too much into the politics around international aid, we need to also recognize that many third world nations have a large dollar denominated debt burden. The IMF provides a certain level of assistance to make sure that the loans are available to these developing nations. 
Sure. The immediate impact of receiving loans is generally positive for the economies of these nations. But over time, the nations find that they are in a difficult position of having to obtain dollars to satisfy the terms of the loans. This provides even more international demand for the dollar. So I've listed here the factors that I know create a demand for dollars. These are the barriers that are impeding the world from simply abandoning the dollar system immediately. If they weren't all there, we would have seen a much more abrupt dollar system failure. But as it stands, many in the rest of the world will need to plan very carefully in order to extricate themselves from this system. And so the transition away from the dollar can be expected to happen slowly over time and then suddenly. We can see the pillars of support gradually crumbling now. On the oil trade side, we are seeing energy deals struck in currencies other than dollars, and we are seeing an unusual amount of political unrest in the oil exporting nations. On the tax front, we are seeing high percentages of American workers dropping out of the workforce, and delinquency rates on property taxes have been ex escalating. On the debt side, we see that the debts are so large that they're becoming very difficult to service, and the U.S. consumer isn't piling on debt like they have in the past. They've saturated themselves. This places the fate of the dollar into question, as well as the fate of all financial instruments that are denominated in dollars. This should all be enough to cause anyone to favor gold over financial instruments at this point in time. The crumpling of all of these support structures is one of the reasons that I favor gold over financial instruments myself. However, it's not the principal reason. And I will tell you the principal reason that I prefer gold to the dollar denominated instruments, and it has nothing to do with gain. It has more to do with the words that can be used to describe the support structures that exist for the dollar. If you look closely at all of the factors that provide demand for the dollar, what are some of the words that come to mind that tie them all together? I will not enumerate them all here because they are all quite negative in their connotation. If you choose to do so, you can list a few of your own in the comment section. I, for one, don't care to associate myself with such negative factors. I choose to withdraw my support from them, and I do this by accumulating gold. But in the spirit of defining things by defining what they are not, let's see if we can come up with some words that describe gold ownership against which we can compare the dollar. The words one might choose are peace, voluntary trade, freedom, property rights, prosperity, wealth, justice. Of course, these are just my words. You might choose a completely different set of words. Either way, you're faced with a decision. Life is not just about gain and loss. Sometimes we have to decide for ourselves the set of values that are important to us and act accordingly.